If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Also, after watching this video, you may want to refer to some of the playlists that we have created for people who are interested in in-depth knowledge. These are the videos in the right sequence, which will give you thorough knowledge of the subject. Please share it with all others who might benefit. So far, we've talked about the properties of the activation functions. And in this tutorial, we'll try to evaluate the popular activation functions with respect to these properties so that we can better understand their strengths and weaknesses. Remember, activation functions play a very important role in neural networks, so understanding them is crucial for your success in deep learning. Let's get started. The first activation function, which happens to be the most classic activation function, it simply used to be called a decision function in the earlier times, is the step function. What is the definition of a step function? It is zero for the values of x less than zero. You can see it's always attaining a value zero. It is one for all the values of x greater than or equal to zero. So basically in between there is a jump. It is not a continuous function. So when you see this line in between, don't imagine as if it's attaining all these values. It attains only two values, either zero or one. Now let's bring the magnifying glass and try to evaluate its properties. Is this nonlinear? Well, people might argue that this is a line and this is also a line, so it is linear. Well, actually not, because when we talk about linearity, we need one single line. And this is piecewise linear, you may argue, but this is not totally linear the way we'd want it to be. Now let's talk about differentiability. Now, as you can see, the output is always constant. So when you take a derivative of a step function, here's what you'll get. This orange line, if you see the thin line that you see here is representing the derivative of the step function. It will always remain zero because it attains only the constant values and the derivative of a constant is always zero. So this is a cross here. Remember, nonlinearity was a desirable property. Step function had that. Differentiability is a desirable property and step function does not have that. Zero centeredness. If you take the center of this function, it'll be somewhere here. We're talking about the center with respect to the y-axis. So center would be at 0.5. It is not zero centered. Zero centered means half of the function is above zero and half of the function is below zero. It doesn't seem to show that. So it's not zero centered. This is again across. Computational efficiency. It's very easy to compute. Why? Because it only gives you two outputs, zeros and ones. And these are the only choices that we have. So it's computationally very efficient. Saturation effect. Does it show saturation? Remember, this is an undesirable property. Now, people might argue that there's no question of a saturation when the function itself is constant, but the point is one and the same. Beyond a point, it would not change its values. And that's why we are scoring it low for saturation effects as well. If we take a derivative of a step function, it always remains zero. That's where we have a problem. The gradients would not get updated. Now let's move to another popular activation function, which is known as the sigmoid. Actually, sigmoid is a family of functions. Within sigmoid, this is logistic in particular. The definition of a logistic function is this. It's 1 over 1 plus e raised to the power negative x. Now let's look at the magnifying glass and try to evaluate this. Is this nonlinear? Of course, no doubt. This is not linear at all. Differentiability. Let's try to look at the derivative. How does the plot of a derivative of sigmoid looks like? So it looks like this. This orange line represents the derivative. If you see, the derivative is more like a symmetrical shape that you see, which kind of goes to zero beyond a point as you move away from zero in either direction. It does attain a maximum value of 0.25. So overall, we can say compared to a step function, the derivative of a sigmoid attains some values. It becomes zero beyond certain points, but it does also attain some values in between. So it is differentiable. Zero centeredness, it is not zero centered. It is again centered at 0.5. Computational efficiency, it's a warning here. Why? Because computationally, exponents are more expensive compared to just a constant value. So this is more expensive, and that's why we call it moderate computational efficiency. Saturation effect, it scores a low here for this. Why? Because it has saturation. If you see the end here, beyond a point on x-axis, it'll always be flat. And so is the case for the negative x values. Beyond a point, it'll always be flat. The derivatives will all start becoming zero beyond a point. Next on our list is the tan h function. This again comes from the sigmoid family but it's a hyperbolic tangent function. And now let's look at the function. So there can be multiple representations of tan h. It can be written like this, or it can also be written like this. Both are one and the same. Let's bring the magnifying glass and have a closer look at tan h. Is it nonlinear? The answer is yes, it's nonlinear. Is it differentiable? Let's look at the derivative of tan h. 
So if you see the derivative of tan h looks like this. It looks very similar to the kind of derivative that you saw for sigmoid, but there is a difference. The maximum value that a sigmoid's derivative could attain was 0.25, whereas the maximum value that a tan h derivative can attain is 1. Tan h derivative is given by this function, and it attains a maximum value of 1, which means it attains more values. This is another advantage. While it's differentiable, it also is capable of attaining a greater variety of derivatives. Next is zero-centeredness. It is zero-centered, and this is a very important strength because such functions tend to converge faster. They find the optimal results faster, and it matters when you're dealing with complex data set and complex algorithms. Computational efficiency-wise, it again doesn't score great because it again involves exponents. And it also suffers from the saturation effects once again because beyond a point, the activation function is flat. Same goes for the negative x values. Now, one activation function which happens to be very popular, especially for the hidden neurons, is known as the rectified linear unit. And it looks like this. Its function is defined as the max of 0 and x, a very simple function, actually. So when you have values less than 0, it will always remain 0. And the moment you are ahead of 0, it will just attain the value just like the line y is equal to x. Let's bring our magnifying glass and try to evaluate this. Is this nonlinear? Well, again, people might argue this is linear and this is also linear. But the point is, this is not a single line. It is called piecewise linear. It's not overall linear. Differentiability. It is not differentiable at zero. Let me show you the derivative of ReLU or rectified linear unit. Now you can see this orange line represents the derivative of rectified linear unit. So wherever the activation function was zero, the derivative would always remain zero. Why? Because the derivative of a constant is zero. The moment the function has started attaining a value of x, you can imagine when you differentiate x with respect to itself, the value that you'll get will be one. So it attains a value of one throughout in the positive range and zero in the negative range. That's why in calculus, when you calculate the limits, the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit would not equate. But even if you don't understand calculus, it's totally fine. You can imagine it's non-differentiable because it does take a sharp turn. That's another property to look at. Generally, functions which take these sharp edges are not differentiable at those specific points. So it's not differentiable at zero. It's differentiable everywhere else. Coming back to our list, zero-centeredness. It is not zero-centered. You cannot call this center. Zero-centered means centered with respect to y. Not that half of the function is below this value of y as zero. That's why it is not zero-centered. Computational efficiency is very high because it's a very simple function. Max of zero or x. Saturation effects. Again, we're putting a cross here. See, one thing that's good about ReLU is that in the positive range, it never saturates. It does saturate, however, in the negative range because it's always a constant. And that's definitely an opportunity. So in order to overcome this opportunity for the negative range, a couple of variants of ReLU were introduced. First of them is known as the leaky ReLU. What they did was that they defined the function like this. They said the value of x for the positive range would remain as is, but for the negative range, we'll call it alpha times x. Now this alpha is like a slope of the line that we're introducing, and it'll be a very small value something like a 0.1 or 0.01. So it ensures that this line maintains some slope and we can keep on taking its derivative. Let's bring our magnifying glass. Is it nonlinear? Again, it's piecewise linear, but overall nonlinear. What about the derivative? It is not again differentiable at zero. You have a sharp edge here. Let me show you the derivative of leaky rel. The derivative, if you see, looks very similar to the way you saw it for rel. But if you see, this line for the range, which is for negative x values, is not exactly zero. Why? Because if you take a derivative of 0.1x with respect to x, the derivative would be 0.1. And that's why this line is not overlapping with zero. So this is one advantage. Remember one thing, when we talk about saturation, we talk about the saturation of the activation function, not the saturation of the derivative. Derivatives may attain a constant value. We don't want that constant value to be zero. If they attain a value of one throughout, we don't have a problem. If they attain anything other than zero throughout, we don't have a problem because that way the neural network is learning something at all time. Another variant of ReLU is known as the exponential linear unit or LU, which essentially in the negative range does a modification. It's like this. For the positive values of x, it'll be 
greater than or equal to zero. But for the negative values of x, it's alpha times e raised to the power x minus one. Again, let's bring the magnifying glass and look at it closely. Is it nonlinear? Yes, it is nonlinear. Is it differentiable? Again, this is not differentiable at zero, but differentiable everywhere else. Let me show you the derivative of LU. So the derivative of LU looks like this. It attains a constant value in the positive range. In the negative range, it becomes zero, but that's not something that happens immediately. It does attain such a values up to a certain point. So it's actually differentiable everywhere else except for the point zero. Zero centeredness, it is not zero centered again with respect to the y values. Computational efficiency is moderate here because we are again calculating the exponents to find out the values in the negative region of x. Saturation effects, we've given it a right tick here because it does saturate in the negative region but does not saturate immediately because it's following an exponent function, which does not let it die so soon as the ReLU's used to die. Now we'll talk about a relatively more advanced activation function, which was introduced by the Google researchers in the year 2017. And this is known as Swish. It looks a little different. Let me show you the function first. So this is a product of x multiplied by the sigmoid of x. Let's try to bring our magnifying glass and evaluate it. Is it nonlinear? Yes, it's nonlinear. Is it differentiable? What will be the derivative of this? Let me show you the graph. It looks like this. So if you see the derivative of this is not a zero in the positive region. In the negative region of x, it does become zero after a point. Again, if you see, it doesn't die down like the classic ReLU immediately. It's only after a point that it may attain saturation, that too in the negative direction. Coming back, is it zero centered? Not really, it's not zero centered. Computational efficiency, it actually is complex to calculate because you have the sigmoid involved and you are doing a product with x as well. And saturation effects, We've given it a tick mark again because it is better than ReLU. It does saturate, but does not saturate immediately and does not saturate in both the directions like tan age and sigmoid. At least half of it is free from saturation and the negative half is also free to a great extent. So just now we finished looking at the popular activation functions and here is a grid that you might want to take a screenshot of because it gives you one view of the important critical properties of activation functions. You get to know about their strengths and weaknesses. Again, is there one activation function that's preferred all the time? Heuristically, if we talk about it, to begin with, we can always start with the value in the hidden layer and choose the appropriate function for the output layer. And we can always experiment with them because depending on the complexity of the data and the architecture of the network, these activation functions respond differently. So we'll have to still do a lot of experiment, but at least you understand the foundation as to how these activation functions work and what are their strengths and weaknesses. Hope this helps.